Good afternoon. My name is Holger Borg Axelsen. I'm with the Department of Computer Science, the University of Copenhagen. And in the next 10 minutes or so, I'll tell you about reversible computing, how we can run computations in reverse. Okay, so why look at this weird topic? Well, the fundamental motivation comes from energy concerns. So computers use a lot of energy. There are more than 3 billion personal computers in use, and we have in excess of 30 million servers running constantly around the world. So uh, next time you use Google, remember that there are 10,000 servers handling your request. Right? And all of these sum up to use a tremendous amount of energy, uh, more than 2.5% of the entire energy budget of the world. So one fundamental question you might ask then is why? Why do computers use energy? Now, energy, as you may recall, is something from physics. So, the thing to do is to submit this to a physical analysis. So, in the 1940s, with the advent of electronic computers, physicists started to ask themselves this question. Why did their house-sized computer use so much energy? Uh, but it wasn't until the, uh, the early 60s, in 1961, that this fellow, uh, Rolf Landau, a German physicist with uh, IBM, came up with a surprising answer. He found that it is irreversibility that places a lower limit on what we can do with respect to energy. So this is codified in what's known as Landauer's principle, which says that for every irreversible operation you do, you have to dissipate a minimal amount of energy. And there's this expression here, ln2 kb times t, which is if you calculate it a very tiny amount, but you don't need to care about this yet. So, if you're a computer scientist, like I am, you might ask yourself then, this is interesting, so what's an irreversible operation? Okay, this is best understood by an example. So consider the following very simple machine. It does nothing except add two numbers together. So we give it the inputs two and two, and it produces the answer four. Okay, so far so good. Now, if we try to invert this machine, and we try to run it backwards, right, then we give it four, and we now ask what were the inputs that resulted in four. And the trouble is here that this machine doesn't know how to answer. It cannot tell us that the inputs were 2 and 2, because they could just as easily have been 1 and 3, or 0 and 4, and so on and so forth. There are many different ways to sum to 4. Okay? And this fundamentally is the property of irreversibility. This machine is irreversible. Now the reason we care about this is that for the last 40 years, the semiconductor industry, on which your computers are built, have been able to exponentially decrease the amount of energy used per bit operation. Okay? So even though the limit placed by Landau's principle is very, very tiny, it's been the case that we've been able to decrease our energy with an order of magnitude every one and a half, two years in what you might remember as Moore's law. And now we're only about four, five, six orders of magnitude away. But the principles on which we build our computers today are irreversible. So this cannot continue. Right? We, the projection of what will happen will have to bend off before it hits this limit. Okay, so that means that your computer won't be getting faster every two years for the foreseeable future. And there is some time, and you can actually already feel the effects in various ways, such as the advent of multi-core processors and so on, that heat is actually becoming a, a, a serious problem. Now, the key insight here is that this applies only to irreversible computations. If we use reversible computations, then this barrier disappears. And we should be able to lower the energy consumption per operation, basically without limit. But, of course, this particular limit is a very, very tiny amount. And in fact, it's, been, uh, it's so tiny that it took 50 years from the, uh, from the establishment of the theoretical principle to experimental ver uh, validation. Right? So, in 2012, we saw that 
uh, this principle holds. We cannot lower the energy limit with irreversible computations. And actually, uh, later that year, we also saw that it is possible to lower reversible operations lower than the limit. All right, so that's for irreversible versus reversible. So we know what an irreversible computation is. What then is a reversible computation? Well, let's go back to our plus example. So we saw that this machine, the one that adds two numbers, was irreversible. But it's a really useful operation. Right? It doesn't seem like we can do much if we can't do this. So what you do in reversible computation is that you try and change the mode of operation. You try to add something to the output of the machine sufficient enough to make it reversible. So in this case, we might add an additional output and turn it into not just a plus machine, but a plus minus machine. Such that when we give it x and y, it returns both their sum, which we're interested in, in their difference, which we might also be interested in. Now, if we give this 3 and 1, this results in 4 and 2, as you might expect. But if we now try to uh, run this machine backwards, as before, and we give it two arbitrary inputs, like 8 and 2, then it's not difficult to see that these actually uniquely define the inputs, 5 and 3. Okay, So this machine now has the property of reversibility. So you can see that it's not actually the same as it happened before with the plus machine, which means that somehow reversible computations are fundamentally different. So if we want to use, like say, the plus machine as a building block for our machines, for our computers in total, then we'll have to transform them somehow such that they use operations looking like this. Okay, and this is a problem because a reversible computer, assuming that we can actually build one, has to be reversible at all abstractions levels inside the computer. So that means both in the physical implementation, in how we actually build the uh, transistors and so on and whatnot that might be in there, but also all the way up to the actual programs and algorithms we run on such a uh, computer. So that poses another uh, computer science problem, namely, how do we use one of these computers? They're fundamentally different from the ones we have now, but on the other hand, we don't want to lose all of the information we have about computing already and all of the programs we like to run on our existing computers. So at top level, we saw that we actually need new programming languages. We need reversible programming languages. And okay, we can design and build these and they run, uh, but they're different from what we have before. In particular, it's not the case that we can simply take an existing problem, uh, program and say, this is now a reversible program. No, it doesn't work. So we need new programs. This requires one of two fundamentally uh, dichromatic um, uh, approaches. So if we have an irreversible program and we want to turn it into a reversible program, then either we do this automatically using a program, we build a method for translating irreversible programs to reversible ones, or we do it by hand. And there is a trade-off here in that if we do it automatically, then yes, we have a solution. We have a program that works for every irreversible program, but it doesn't always produce uh, desirable results. The resulting uh, reversible programs might not be as quick or they might use too much energy compared to what we're looking for. On the other hand, if we do things by hand, then surprisingly we can actually get extremely good results, right? <coughs> even if the algorithms are horribly irreversible to start with. But this requires a huge amount of human insight, which basically algorithmics does in the first place. So maybe this is not so surprising. But the upshot is then that physics has placed some limits on what we can actually do with computers. So it's not a matter of simply being smart. There are physical limits to what we can do and how efficient we can be in computation. And surprisingly, by doing something as intuitively simple as adding a reverse gear for our computers, we can break through some of these limits. But it requires that we fundamentally alter how we build computers and how we think about computation in order to learn to do reversible computations. Thank you.